Okay, starting, let go. Hello, everybody. Thank you to everybody watching at home on Facebook Live and everybody here in beautiful downtown Woonsocket, Rhode Island for part two of Illuminating the Legacy of Slavery in Rhode Island by the Women Project. Um, we want to thank a few folks before we get started. Um, first of all, our artists and our scholars, Neha uh, Sayu Degan, uh, Morgan Greff, and the Rhode Island Historical Society, uh, Marlon O'Carey, and Aganza. Uh, what you see behind you is beautiful artwork by the artist Aganza and also by the artist Deborah Baronis over here. Um, and what you will hear is a reading from an excerpt from Marlon O'Carey's promotion. Uh, so thank you to our funders as well, um, the Rhode Island State Council on the Arts, the Rhode Island State Council for the Humanities, and the Providence Department of Arts and Culture. Thank you to each of you for your contributions to this project. It would not be nearly as spectacular without the contributions of each of you. So without further ado, here is the fabulous, fabulous Daria Lyric Monticola with her reading for this evening. acknowledge that we are standing here on stolen land. The captured prisoners of the Pequot War in 1637, members of the Pequot, Narragansett, and Wampanoag clans were the first to be enslaved here. For the first 100 years, they were sold and traded as property, way before the first enslaved Africans arrived in 1638, courtesy of William Pierce from Salem, Massachusetts, who traded 17 Pequot captives in the West Indies for some cotton and tobacco and Negroes. See those ships sailing out of Newport and Providence off to the western Cape of Africa to body snatch humans, usually between 200 and 600 human beings below decks in the cargo. The average Rhode Islander in the 17th and 18th century were quite accustomed to buying a few shares in a slave voyage. It was no different to them than buying shares of corporation is for us today. It was a high-risk investment, but if successful, meaning the captains of these ships managed to capture or harbor or kidnap men, women, children, and so the strongest of all the women, into labor on the sugar plantations on the islands of the West Indies, South America, and Cuba, they would receive a tiny profit. More sugar, more rum, more slaves. Slavery in Rhode Island is so endemic, it would be impossible to understand the history of this state without understanding the many roles enslaved people played in the state's emergence as a major maritime player in the 17th and 18th centuries. Slavery was practiced in Rhode Island until the 1800s despite several legal attempts to curb the practice. In 1652, Rhode Island passed the first abolition law in the 13th colonies by the slave law, but the law was not enforced by the end of the 17th century. In the years after the revolution, Rhode Island merchants controlled between 60 and 90 percent of the American trade in enslaved African people. In the Narragansett country out in South Kingstown and South County, the farms and orchards were the plantations where they grew the crops for feeding the people laboring on the plantations in Jamaica, Barbados, Cuba, etc. Women in particular, captive and free of life, were busy growing incredible amounts of food and churning butter, chopping wood, and making clothing all for the human machine of slavery. The plantation economy required a constant supply of enslaved workers in order to feed the two corners of the triangle trade. Enslaved people were forced to make the sails for the merchant ships, the shackles that held their brethren in the West Indies, grow the food, tend the livestock, and make all the products that would be sent to further enslave more of their people. The psychological damage of this reality must have been a crushing weight on Africans and natives, who were always moving through the city on errands and laboring, without the freedom that the captives and slave masters so ardently fought for themselves during the Revolutionary War. More sugar, more rum, more slaves. More sugar, more rum, more slaves. The history we received as young Rhode Islanders has been a tangled web of intricate design. 
We marvel at the mansions of New York and are awestruck by the wealth of the Golden Age. We missed the irony that the wealth of New England was built on the same industry that built the wealth of the Southern plantation owners. We are free to explore issues of personhood and freedom, waxing philosophical about the concepts of right and wrong during colonial America. But the inequalities wrought by New England's economic dependence on slavery continue to this day. The very streets of New York The very streets we walk on are paved with the blood and sweat of enslaved Africans and natives. We still live in a system that exploits one group to benefit another. Over the course of the transatlantic slave trade, some estimated two million slaves died in the Middle Passage. They didn't have to die, but it seems we needed them to. After the Revolutionary War and the Declaration in 1776, several Rhode Island families, including the DeWolfs, took over the slaving voyages and ignored many laws that were designed to halt trafficking in slaves. Thomas Jefferson helped to install a DeWolf family member as the head of the Coast Guard allowing their business to thrive without legal consequences until 1842 when the slave trade was finally banned in New England. More sugar, more rum, more slaves. Some of us may choose to ignore the fact that the perpetrators of the worst crimes in our nation's history were upstanding New England citizens. That they were not, as previously thought, merely liberty-loving Christians who believed in equal rights for all, but a society of wealthy merchants seduced by greed into selling and trading their fellow men. Many of us are beginning to examine this in our that the North perpetuates to cover up our complicity, even worse, our investment in slavery. Not only do we hide the truth about the vastness of slavery in Rhode Island, its significant effects on our economy and the impact of infamous slaveholders in our state, but we also flagrantly disregard the influence of black abolitionists and leaders and their resistance. Here in Moonsocket, there is a sculpture and numerous articles do that document Abraham Lincoln's visit to the city, where he spoke to crowds about the evils of slavery. But nowhere do we commemorate the anti-slavery convention that Frederick Douglass convened at Moonsocket Falls in 1841, where he and local, local ab abolitionist Abby Kelly were attacked for their speeches on the subject. Nowhere do we speak of the unprecedented leadership of Thomas Howland, the first African American to be elected to public office in Providence in 1857. And nowhere do we talk about Marie Angelique, an enslaved woman in Canada convicting of setting fire to her plantation owner's home as an act of resistance. The following excerpts about Marie Angelique are written by theater maker, actor, wordsmith, and Ingram of Brown Rep, Nehesayu Dekat. The poet shared this note. Though haunted by the state of Rhode Island and Providence plantations, I didn't know when I wrote the poem, but found out several years later, there is historical evidence to suggest Marie Angelique was purchased in New England and quite possibly Rhode Island. Trust the messages that come to you on the wind. A note by Daniel G. Hill, The Freedom Seekers. In 1734, Angelique, a black slave of Francois Pouy of Montreal, was told that she was to be sold. In her fear and resentment, she set fire to her master's house. The house and other nearby property were destroyed and Angelique was arrested, convicted of arson, and sentenced to hang. A rope was tied around her neck, signs bearing the word incendiary were fastened on her neck and chest, and she was driven through the streets in a scavenger's cart. Worse was to come, she was tortured until she confessed her crime before a priest, and her hand was cut off and she was hanged upon. early Canada, heavy black boots crunch up Hope Street. So this is Providence, Rhode Island. My tongue is dubious of New England names. Benevolent and angel appear and reappear in thick circles of air. Across Lloyd, I run. Purple woolen fingers along a strip of iron bars, tasting dates hammered into iron plates. Here, history gives itself away. 
Mount Hope is not a mountain or a fort or not even a church, but a daycare center run by women. Mothers who come from the islands, not this island, leave on mornings. Now at dusk they reappear, purple silhouettes against the chain link, big, chain link fence whistling names. One child quivers at the hiss and ring of her name. In the Antilles, a wet finger kissing hot iron flickers the way a, tongue snake flick, a snake's tongue flickers. A woman reappears, then disappears, begging light at my grandmother's door. She hopes to reclaim a body. She has come for her island daughter. A tropical silhouette, I run, waiting thick snow until I can't outrun the years anymore. Even streets shed their names. Hope belts east, looping south to Blackstone, La Ceinture Dieu. So I bury the belt to my traveling dress under the iron weed, next to a paling fence, a sway-backed serpent molting hope of everlasting life. Salt water souls appear to disappear from this New England town. Once in New France, I appeared a cardboard plaque for a face, black ink running incendiary language, a mother's reverent hope for a daughter. Hello, my name is, my father's name is, in case of fire call, now my feet really feel like Iron Bell blues and waited, bringing this plantation island, an electric crucifix crests that real mountain island where mother and child are sighted, reappearing. At dusk, white lights twinkling on a skeleton of iron, we begin our thunderous descent. Blood runs, a river runs down my brow. It's its name with the moon. This flowering fist is a vain stump of hope. I sigh, angel. Angelique appears. In a flickering red run, a siren's angelus. Rhode Island ignites the pa palingenesis of a name. My bilingual retina hosts her smoldering. My ironic hunger for home. The Torch Song of Marie Angelique. You open your mouth, a dream of water spilling out. I open my mouth, and the skies ablaze. You open your mouth, a dream of water spilling out. I open my mouth, and the skies ablaze. Roger Williams. Yeah. Roger Williams, remember Roger Williams? Of course you do. He was called the incendiary of New England for championing religious tolerance when he founded the Hope Colony, Rhode Island. And I, Marie Angelique, become known as the incendiary of Canada for setting fire to my master's house. When I was to be sold. When I was to be sold. Quick, Marie Angelique girl, slip your hand into the flickering flame. Fetch a blazing stick and lick the house. Ship, shape, scream. You open your mouth, a dream of water spilling out. I open my mouth and the skies ablaze. You open your mouth, a dream of water spilling out. I open my mouth and the skies ablaze. Perhaps I learned a thing or two from old Roger when I was purchased in Rhode Island. Twin survivors, this child and I, she escaped by water, I escaped by fire. Now those never dance it, they set fire to poor Roger's home. They did? Aha, uh -huh, after the Great Swamp Massacre. Perhaps it was those Narragansett taught me a thing or two on my passage through the province of Asians. You open your mouth. A dream of water spilling out, I open my mouth in Montreal's ablaze. You open your mouth. A dream of water spilling out, I open my mouth in Montreal's ablaze. Priest whipped and carted off, I will my freedom, so to speak. You like this scar, little one? Homage to my stumped comme ci, comme ça? I call it kissatrix. Why, my hands become a wing thing. A hawk's wing, you say? P.S. Blown away on the whoosh of the executioner's sword. Whap, rope, throat. My head is heavy, this day is long. Drowned bat, dangling spider. You to your ocean door me to my high wire. Thank you. And thanks for watching at home. Bye.
Thank you everybody for watching. This has been Illuminating the Legacy of Slavery in Rhode Island by The Woman Project with funding from the Rhode Island State Council on the Arts, the Rhode Island Council for the Humanities, and the Providence Department of Arts and Culture. You have seen artwork by Aganza. You've heard writing by Nehesayu Degan, Marlon O'Carry, and now you're seeing artwork by Deborah Baronis. Stay tuned for our next installment in mid-September in Cranston. Thank you, everybody. Good night.